You're listening to Shalise's podcast. Let's get this party started. <clears throat> All right. Well, Father, thank you for yet another broadcast, and thank you for just the opportunity to talk about this topic today. Thank you that you have supernaturally drawn, that you have supernaturally drawn every single listener to this broadcast this morning. And I thank you that there is a word in due season. This is specifically what they need to hear in this hour. And so we just yield. We yield to your agenda, Father. We, we welcome you and your presence here, Holy Spirit. Do what you do best. Teach us. Help us. Guide us into all truth. Show us the future. Reveal the Father to us. Reveal Jesus. Reveal yourself to us. Grant us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you and enlighten the eyes of our understanding so that we can know the hope of our calling because we know you. Thank you that we were recreated in Christ to know you, that eternal life is knowing the one true God and Jesus Christ. And I thank you that you are knowable. I thank you that you are a master at renewing our minds and breaking through the distortions that we have learned about who you are. You are better than we've imagined and you do exceedingly abundantly above all we can think, all we can ask, all we can dream. And so we just press in this morning to learn of you and we thank you holy spirit that you're awesome at your job renew our minds help us repent help us change our minds help us believe the gospel and help uh, us elevate our thinking to yours with the mind of christ so that we can see the fullness of who you are and who we are in you in jesus name amen amen Well, awesome, you guys. I'm starting a new series today uh, that is really near and dear to my heart. Uh, I have been teaching and talking about what we, we call the five big cues or the five big questions of life. Really, within my ministry, within my my school, within my book now for years, and honestly, it's some of the most powerful revelation that I personally have ever received, and it is changing people's lives every every time they, they encounter it, whether they're reading my book, where they're a part of the merge, it is literally changing your lives. We call these questions the five big questions of life um, because truly I, I know uh, with every fiber of my being that they are literally the most important questions that we can ask and answer in our lifetimes. And I really can't take credit for even coming up with these questions because they were God breathed and God revealed them to me uh, years ago when we were developing the Emerge curriculum together. And the five questions are these. Okay. So who is God is question number one. Who am I is question number two. Who, uh, why am I here is question number three. Where am I headed is question number four. And how do I get there is question number five. And so these questions, getting the answers to these questions really from God directly for yourself, your personal God breathed answers to these questions are, are, are one of the most powerful exercises that you can go through because it's like putting a compass in your hand. It not only gives you the direction really for the rest of your life and, and the definition of who you are and your purpose and where you're going in life and what your assignment is and the very purpose and reason and why you exist in this hour, in this age, in this time, but they lead you into the exercise of having the conversations with God that literally catapult you into a life of sonship where you are living in union with Jesus, uh, directly living as, as in that place of intimacy with him in Christ, in the middle of the triune love, in the middle of relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to, to the degree that Jesus enjoyed that intimacy. And they empower you for supernatural living. Because when we get on God's agenda and we relate to God for who he actually is, not who we've learned him to be over the course of our lifetime, you know, from our family of origin or from uh, our church or from the places that we've gotten secondhand knowledge about God, 
or secondhand interpretations of scripture from God, but these, the, these, this revelation is revolutionary. And so I'm super, super excited to be jumping into the first cue this morning, who is God and, and coming at this from a new, fresh perspective. And I really encourage you to do that. You know, don't enter into these broadcasts or reading my book or doing the work that we do in Emerge with preconceived ideas, uh, because there's always more to know. There's always more revelation to uncover. And we really have to come like little children. We have to come curious and we have to be open minded that that all of us have some level of unbelief about who God is. We're not, none of us are experiencing the fullness of the Godhead really to the maximum degree that, that Jesus died for us to experience. So I encourage you just to, you know, come with an open mind to these next few broadcasts and really dive into the topic with me as we go a little bit deeper. So. I wanted to kick off today uh, giving you some examples of my students' uh, answers to these questions after they've done the work, and also give you my own answer to this question. And I'm doing this from memory. I mean, when I work with my clients and I work with my students to come up with these answers, it truly is like we're sitting in heaven and the veil is pulled back and we are truly able to see people for who God created them to be. You know, Paul said, don't judge any man after the flesh. And truly, we can't judge God in the flesh. And so this is like pulling that flesh back and getting these answers. And the answers are the, the answer specifically to who is God is not just about who God is in general to the general world. It's not even about just about who he is to you personally, although it's absolutely about that. It's, it's about the revelation of God that you're also destined to carry and reveal to the world. And when you dive into answering these questions, what's interesting about it, it's like you learn that everything in your life on some level is perfect. I'm not saying that you had a perfect life. I'm saying that everything that you've experienced is perfect for your destiny and woven into this revelation of God that you carry. And it is it, it gives meaning and significance in a different context to your life. You no longer look at the things that you've been through, even the terrible things that you've been through in the same light. You're able to reframe that. You're able to look at those things as the things that developed you into the person who can carry this revelation of God and has developed the muscle that you need to fulfill your destiny. I mean, the Apostle Paul is a great example of this. I mean, here he started out as a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was persecuting the church, you know, actually standing by while Christians were martyred. But yet God used all of that religi religiosity and all of that uh, relationship with the law to actually perfectly prepare him into an apostle to the Gentiles, one that was an, you know, an anti-legalist, that one that was basically coming to say that Jesus abolished the law. And so his background perfectly prepared him for the revelation of Christ and the revelation of Christ in us. And even though it might have seemed negative on paper. So that's the, the power of these questions. They give you context. They help you reframe uh, everything about your life and put you right smack dab in the middle of purpose and in the middle of a revelation that is unique to you. So let's start off with just my answer to the question, who is God? Actually, what I want to do is I want to... Um, I want to start with the scripture. So let me back up. I want to start today in a, a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples in Matthew chapter 16. And in Matthew chapter 16, let me just go there. I'm reading in the Passion Translation. Uh, in verse 13, it says this, when Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples this question. What are the people saying about me, the son of man? Who do they believe I am? And so this question, who is God, comes right out of this conversation. Who do people believe that I am? In verse 14, uh, Simon answers, or they answered, it says, some, of, some are convinced that you are John the baptizers. Others say that you are Elijah, reincarnated, or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And so what I want to say about verse 14 is that this just goes to show you how people just have their ideas, their own ideas about who God is, about who Jesus is. 
And if I went out and interviewed people on the street and asked them who is God, you know that would be the case, that people would just come up with all these answers and some people would say Jesus Christ and some people would have like these generic answers about who is God. But in verse 15, Jesus turns to his disciple and he says, but you, who do you say that I am? Jesus asked. In verse 16, Simon Peter spoke up, good old, good old Simon Peter, always getting out of the boat here. And he says, you are the anointed one, the son of the living God. In verse 17, Jesus replied, you are favored and privileged, Simon, son of Jonah, because you didn't discover this on your own. But my father in heaven has supernaturally revealed it to you. And so this is a powerful passage leading into answering the question, who is God? Because it really gives us the context that our revelation of who God is really needs to be supernaturally revealed to us. And so that is exactly what we do in my work. And so my question that has been supernaturally revealed to me, the answer to my question, who is God? I mean, this is, this is my, I'm going to share it here in a second, but just to let you know, I mean, this is such a powerful revelation in my own life. It's the kind of revelation that I'm going to be unpacking for the rest of my life. I am learning constantly uh, from this, this, this answer. And it gives context to really everything that I'm going through all the time, because this is my life's journey to experience God in this revelation of who he is to me and the revelation that I carry. So my answer to that question, who is God, is God is my inexhaustible source who supplies anything and everything I need to experience the fullness of who he is and manifest the fullness of who I am in him. Okay, so that is like an example of this, this, the answer that you get from God about this question. And, and you, as you can see, like that is like deep, deep waters. Like that is something that I'm going to be unpacking for the rest of my life, that God is my inexhaustible source that supplies anything and everything I need to experience the fullness of who he is. Like how awesome is that? And then, to manifest the fullness of who I am. He is my source, that he is the source of anything and everything I need. And so what that means is that I'm on a journey in my life to get rid of any inferior source. And everything that I experience is an opportunity for God to be my source. And so this is an example, you know, one example of many that I could give from my students' work that is is the power of an answer to the question, who is God? A couple of others that I can just remember off the top of my head, um, our RMR facilitator Tracy uh, is, uh, you know, a, a powerful minister, but also uh, living out the revelation of her answer to that question. And her answer to that question is, "God is the family that I always desired and needed, but never had." And if you talk to Tracy or you do sessions with Tracy or you really talk to her about the call of God in her life, she carries a revelation that God is our family, that we live in the middle of the triune family, that we are a family, that God, the revelation of God is a family, that he is our father, he is our husband, he is uh, the one that, that you know, supplies her needs that families provide. And so it's a powerful, powerful answer. And then one other that just comes to mind just off the top of my head, well, I'm on the spot here, is another one of our graduates whose name is Adam. And I just, this one just stuck with me because it it was so powerful. And there was actually a scripture uh, that went with it that I wish I could remember off the top of my head. But he said that God is my eternal entanglement. And that is an incredible answer. When I think and I sit with that answer, you know, I think about the revelation that God is entangled with us, that there's things that take ways that you can take it, take it with the idea of quantum entanglement from a scientific perspective. Like there's so much revelation chalked in to that uh, specific statement. And so as you can see, these are very, very powerful answers to this question, who is God? Okay, the next part that I want to kind of jump into is that I want to just get you really on page with the idea that all, that all of us, regardless of how long we have been you know, saved, regardless of how long we've been walking with God, are carrying at some level, and I mean by carrying, I mean subconsciously believing 
some level of distortion around who is God. And we've picked up these, these subconscious beliefs about God over the course of our lifetime. You know, I went into a little bit of this in my last podcast, my last broadcast, which will be going here live here in the next week or so, uh, that was talking about, you know, being able to encounter and experience God. And I talked about how our family of origin uh, affects our ability to experience God because we subconsciously project onto God the uh, belief systems that we picked up about authority figures over the course of our life, over what the definition of a father is, over what the definition of a mother is, over our experiences with rejection from love, from lovers and, and romantic partners. And I talked a little bit about that in last podcast, but that's a great example of what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, we don't recognize that we're doing that. We don't recognize that all of us, before we kind of step into this level of work, are subconsciously projecting onto God wrong ideas about who he is. And on top of that, we also are operating in some level of belief, unbelief rather, because even though we've read the scriptures that say, you know, God is a healer or God is our provider or God is our, you know, redeemer or God is our source, whatever those, those, whatever the truth of the gospel teaches us, even though we can consciously, you know, agree with that, we can say, yes, that's true. That doesn't mean that we actually believe it at a heart level, level, at a subconscious level, which actually is where the force of faith comes from. And so this is why, even though we agree that thing, with things like God is a provider or God is a healer, that we don't always experience that because we don't necessarily really, really believe that where the rubber meets the road, which is inside of our minds, inside of our subconscious th um, thought patterns and our pa uh, subconscious um, strongholds, because most of us have experienced things that are contrary to that quality of God. Like we all, you know, maybe we've experienced lack, or maybe we've been in situations where we weren't healed or others weren't healed. And so we have evidence uh, of it not being true. And we've picked that up as kind of like this subconscious tension between this is what God says, this is who God says he is, but this is our experience. And the gap between the two is causing doubt and causing um, incongruency in our heart and in our mind. And truthfully, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so we are truly just, you know, propagating the experience of God that we, we subconsciously believe. And this shows up in our day to day life, in our, in, in things like our inability to receive from God or our inability to manifest heaven on earth or who we are in Christ or to hear God clearly. So there's many ways that these distorted beliefs and these, these wrong beliefs about God show up in our ability to relate to God. And it's so very, very important that we get this stuff cleared out and we get our, our minds renewed. And when I say minds renewed, we move from that conscious uh, agreement with God to the subconscious belief about God so that we can experience the fullness of the truth. The, the truth that we know is the truth that sets us free. And what I mean, you know, by that no, it means an intimate knowing, an intimate understanding, a personal revelation of that truth. And that is more than just a mental assent and a conscious agreement with the truth. And this is really what Romans 12, 2 is talking about when it talks about that we are transformed or transfigured by the renewing of our minds, that we, that, that what manifests and what is revealed through us depends on what we ultimately believe. And what we believe about God is the most important set of beliefs that we can ever, ever transform because it dictates really the theology that we relate to God with. It, it, it dictates what is possible in our relationship with God. And truthfully, the, how much of God manifests in our relationship and in our lives. And so this is a very, very, very important question to get settled. And as you can tell from just the conversation Jesus was having with his disciples in in uh, Matthew 16, that, you know, everyone's operating out of these beliefs about God. And you can see, I mean, it makes sense that if people think that, that Jesus was the reincarnation of a, a dead prophet, or if he was John the baptizer somehow, that that was going to limit their ability to relate to him, to receive from him as who he really is. And, and Peter's revelation that he was the son of God, he was the Christ, he was the anointed one, he was the Messiah, completely 
completely changed Peter's ability to receive eternal life, to receive from Jesus. And as we'll go into more in our next um, broadcast, which is going to be answering who is God, if you keep reading in John 16, it also is really clear that it wasn't until Peter had a clear vision and a clear revelation of who God was, that he was able to hear God tell him who he was, right? So I call that the identity cycle. So until we can truly hear from God, this is who you are, this is the revelation of God I carry, then it's really impossible to get the answer to who you are. And who you are is deeper than just a son of God or a child of God or a new creation. Those are all true. The foundation of your identity is Christ in you. It's union with God. But you are so much more than that, right? I mean, here, and I won't go into it a whole lot here. So let me just wait and hold off to the next broadcast because I could talk about how my answer to who is God is related to who I am. And that's always the case whenever we start to go through these questions sequentially. In fact, as you as you build upon your answers to who is God and who am I and why am I here and where am I headed and how do I get there, it actually forms a story and it, it reframes the story of your life. So this question, who is God, is, is obviously paramount. And so I want to just shift gears a little bit in the remaining time that we have together and talk about really the process that, that I take people through in my book, the process that I take people through in my school at a very high level <clears throat> that helps you answer this question. And, you know, you would think that, you know, the, 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 it would be an easy question to answer. But because we have these subconscious beliefs that we're projecting onto our, relation, our relationship with God, what that means is that we have these lenses and these filters that we filter everything through. And this is very true. I mean, and scary almost to a certain degree, because we will, we will interpret what we hear from God. We will interpret scripture. We will interpret even prophetic revelation and prophecy through the lens and the filters that we have put in place. So the very there's a couple of fundamentals that we have to get straight if we're going to really have a clear filter and a clear pipe and a place where where we are an open book and a, a blank canvas for God to have this conversation with us. And the first, you know, foundational thing is that we have to have the ability to hear God. You know, I and I, when I say hear God, I don't mean um, sporadically. I don't mean, you know, when you're in worship. I don't mean after you fasted for, you know, 40 days and 40 nights. That is not at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being able to have conversations with God in the same way that you would have conversations with any other human being on the planet. Jesus Christ is the in incarnate word, but the word became flesh and he, he became a human being. He put human skin on and he is a high priest that is able to understand us, able to uh, relate to us. And it's one of the reasons why I love like watching the new television show, The Chosen, because it humanizes Jesus and Jesus is a human being. Yes, he's God, but he is relatable. He is a person that we can relate to and we need to get to the place that we can relate to him conversationally the way that we relate to other people. And I think one of the first things that we have to move out of the way is just the unbelief around that, because most of us have not been taught or not been equipped um, in, you know, to, to operate with activated spiritual senses where we have ears that are, that are working and we can hear the voice of God as clearly as we can hear our own thoughts. We have enlightened eyes and we have, have the ability to see in the spirit so that we can actually see what the father is doing and operate in a place of dependence upon that. And then the other piece that, that is so important about that is that we have to actually move and transform the distortions that we have learned about God. I mean, when I lead people through this process, it, it, it's a combination of things. It's one is forgiving the influencers that wrongly influenced us, that imprinted upon us, that had a role in that a role to play in us believing the wrong thing, right? And for some people, that's that's I mean, forgiving entire you know denominations. I mean, I've had people have to forgive the Catholic Church or forgive, you know, denominational religion or evangelical Christianity and, you know, forgive their parents for being believers or unbelievers or abusers or all kinds of spiritual 
authority things that they've been through, church experiences. I mean, we, we go through life not realizing that everything that we experience, we are interpreting through a human, through our human judgment, through our limited capacity to interpret things correctly. And so we put meanings, we put judgments on these things. We, we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil without even realizing we're doing it, you know, um, so, for example, if you came from an abusive home and you had an abusive father or you had an abusive mother, you know, subconsciously, you may have made some interpretations and some meanings, meaning you weren't aware you were doing this. It happened so quickly and you're so young that, you know, uh, males can't be trusted or uh, God is distant or God is a punisher. And I, I mean, I know this to be true because I do this work day in and day out with my clients and my students. One that's coming to mind just here um, on the fly is at one of our graduations, we had a student who was still, she was hearing God clearly, but she was really having trouble experiencing the manifest presence of God. And so we just led her through an exercise right there where God took her back to a memory. And in the memory, she was very young. She was maybe three, maybe four. She was in church. She was worshiping God, full of joy, jumping up and down, just, you know, just unashamed and, you know, probably making a little bit of a scene as a kid. And what happened, you know, was that her mother yanked her out of church, took her outside and scolded her for making a scene and embarrassing her. And and she said that she kind of stood up as a little kid to her mom and just, you know, didn't didn't really take it. And I don't know if her mom pushed her. I'm not exactly sure remembering what happened. But the next thing you know, she lands on the ground and she lands on a cigarette butt that is still lit and burns herself. And I mean, you know, wow, when you're walking through this memory, you're just like, wow, of course you can understand how this impacted her. And what she believed is that she, she, she was programmed at the, in that through that experience, through the way she interpreted that as a little child to believe that God is a punisher. And that God is somber. He doesn't celebrate. He doesn't, he doesn't, you know, you, you, you've got to be somber. You can't really, you know, experience the joy of God. And so when we walked through the process of just forgiving her mom for that and just letting God reframe that for her, giving her the truth of what he thought about that experience and talk to her at that place of trauma, all of a sudden the presence of God just fell on her. And that block that she had been experiencing between her and God, that subconscious block was removed and she was just sitting there bawling and just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, the presence of God, I'm tingling all over. And she just began to have this encounter with God. And this woman was... I think in her seventies at this point. And so, I mean, her entire life, she had walked around with this subconscious belief that God was somber, that he was not a joyful or happy God, not in a good mood and that he was a punisher. And I can't tell you that is one example. I mean, I, if I had the time and the space, I literally could go through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples of the way our life experiences have impacted our ability to experience God. And so another part of getting this answer to the question who is God is just moving all of that mind trash, all of that garbage out of our out of our hearts so that we can truly experience God for who he is, not who we learned him to be through our human interactions with others who we trusted, who we who we uh, learned what love is from because God is love, but his love is unlike anything that we've ever experienced. It is absolutely non-judgmental. It is absolutely unconditional. He is not sin conscious because Jesus dealt with sin on the cross, but we have been raised in a performance based society and a performance based system, whether you in the world, whether you've been in church. I mean, we've been trained to really think about what is wrong with us, try to fix what's wrong with us. And we've been trained into an identity that is completely separate from God. And because of that, we, most of us relate to God as distant, not within us, but up in heaven. And we have this image of God, whether we're aware of it or not, that is less than perfect love. And perfect love has no fear in it. It has absolutely no fear of punishment and, and it has no fear at all. And so this process is about moving these fear-based beliefs out of our hearts so that we can truly receive the answer to who God is, but also experience him and know him 
and feel the love of God, feel the presence of God and step into an experiential relationship with him that is, be, that is destined to be, that is designed to be the most powerful, empowering, healing and, and place of joy and bliss, the most incredible experience of our life at, at living out of this place of no shame and no fear and completely being known, completely being accepted, completely being loved. And it gives us permission, guys, when we experience those things, it gives us a, a, a permission to begin to feel that same way about ourselves and be, to begin to heal all of that that division internally and that 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 role that we play as the accuser against ourselves many times blaming the devil but really just just being that the programming that we've been taught that there really is something wrong with us and the truth is in christ there's nothing wrong with us that we we are perfect we are holy we are blameless we are one with him there is no separation in fact that's the illusion of separation is the only thing that's left really to heal the illusion of separation with god and the illusion of separation with ourselves and honestly the illusion of separation with other people division whether it be between us and God us and ourselves or us and other people is the problem of the planet and that is why Jesus came and declared peace on earth peace on earth and goodwill towards men this is a healing process that brings us into wholeness where there is no division wholeness by by definition means there is nothing divided Wholeness means that we are integrated, that we have become one, one with God, one with ourselves, and one with our brothers and sisters, and I mean just every person on the planet, so that we can have peace and that we can enjoy the union that, that, that is in Christ, our union with God, our union with ourselves, and our union with one another. This oneness is a universal truth that Jesus accomplished on the cross when he died for the sins of the whole world. He died as man as the last Adam so that all of that would be removed and all of that alienation from God and alienation within ourselves and alienation from others you know in Colossians it says we're alienated from God in our minds and so this is a healing of our minds this is the healing that causes us to come out of mental illness really I mean to, to some degree, that separation has made all of us to some degree mentally ill, emotionally unstable, and operating out of a place that is less than wholeness. And so, I mean, I know I'm saying a lot this morning, but this is just truly, truly paramount. This is foundational to your life, to your relationship with God in every relationship with your others because with others because when you can see God clearly as we'll talk more about next week you'll begin to see yourself clearly you'll begin to actually begin to love and accept yourself the way Christ does and now you can begin to see other people clearly and you begin to love and accept others in the way that you have experienced it you know loving god with your whole heart soul and mind requires a revelation and it comes out of this grateful this incredible overwhelming gratefulness of what god has accomplished and who he is and how good he actually is and this realization <clears throat> that we don't have to earn anything that this is not a conditional relationship it's the only one in our lives maybe for the first time that we've actually experienced and that we can begin to love ourselves unconditionally we can begin to accept ourselves we can begin to relate to ourselves based upon our oneness with god and then that scripture you know now we can begin to actually love god with our whole heart soul and mind and then love our neighbor as we love ourselves like this commandment is fulfilled through the revelation that I'm sharing with you today. It's not, not a, a, you know, a religious activity that we do to, to love God and to love ourselves and to love our neighbor. No, it's a revelation. It's a, it's a revelation of the love of God. It's God as perfect love. And as we get that revelation, it just completely transforms our lives. And, and we become an instrument that God can use to no longer judge people, no longer be conscious of what's wrong with others and their sin, because we have an understanding of what God has done in us and who God actually is and what the cross actually did and what it means, not only for those that are you know, believing right today, but for everyone who is yet to believe that God has reconciled humanity to himself and it totally radically changes our ability to love others. We come to a place where we are filled we are filled, we are whole. And from that place, 
of being filled and being whole, now we have actually something to, to give to others because we aren't looking to other people to fill that for us. We aren't, we aren't comparing ourselves to others. We, we recognize that it's a, a fair playing field for all of us and that none of us um, can throw the first stone and that it's only by the grace of God that any of us are what we are. And so this revelation is life changing. And, you know, if you want to really dive into it deeper, you know, the best thing to do is to grab, a, you know, a copy of my book. <clears throat> you can go to Amazon and get a copy of that. It's called The Path, uh, Journey with God and Live Your Purpose. Um, there's a free PDF you can get at um, uh www.thepathfreebook.com. Uh, and also the other, you know, I think even more powerful step is to schedule a breakthrough call with us. Let, let us get on a call with you. Let us talk about um, our merge. Let's talk about the school of transformation. Let's talk about the powerful things that are happening to people in that school. <clears throat> I have some of my students and some of my graduates on here today. They will testify to you that it has been, you know, one of the most, if not the most transformational thing they've ever done since, you know, becoming a Christian. And, and we're happy to do those calls. We do that. There's no charge for those calls. And we're happy to help you kind of assess where you are in your understanding of God and the understanding of your life purpose and really what's possible. We'll hear from God about you, for you. We'll hear about, hear from God about your purpose, where you're headed. And we'll give you a step-by-step -step plan to get there, you know, and how you can do that in conjunction with, a whole tribe of people that are going through this process together. So, you know, as we wrap today, I, I my prayer is, is that you will just take on answering uh, a, 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 these questions with, with a, a seriousness and a somberness. And I don't mean that like, you know, I just mean that you will make this a priority in your life, that you will make mind renewal and knowing your purpose and living out of your true identity, your number one priority. I mean, you are here for a reason. You are not here to just take up state space. And I will tell you, the world is waiting on you. The world is waiting on the real you. You know, yesterday I had a very profound experience with someone that I was actually personally on a call with. And it really, really hit me. And it hit me because as she was, as we were diving into, you know, what, where she is in her journey and all of that, you know, she just was weeping. She was just weeping over the things that God was revealing. And at, at one point, you know, she just looked at me just straight in the eye and said, why did it take me so long to find you? And I'll tell you, when she said it, it was like an arrow pierced in my heart. And I realized in that moment that, you know, none of this is really about me. I mean, none of this. I mean, I, I know that. I mean, it's why I show up every single day. But in that moment, I realized, like, I cannot live a life that is less than the fullness of my purpose. I can't play small because people are hurting. People need us to manifest who we are in Christ. They need the call of God on our, God on our life. They need what we carry. They need our freedom. They need us to be free because we propagate and we replicate who we are. And I mean, that is that I tell that story, not just, you know, about because it's about me, but it, it really impacted my heart. Like I immediately reached out to my team and I was like, oh my gosh, like we have to, we have to pour more money into to our marketing campaigns. We have to get this message out to as many people as possible. We have to, we have to expand. We have to get out of the way for God, you know, which for you, what that means is partner with us. Go on over to Shalise.com and partner with us, empower us so that we can reach more and more people with the power and the good news of the real gospel, of the message of union with God and the message of these five cues. I mean, guys, I do not have words to express the, the revolution that happens in our lives as we begin to step into this. So, God bless you. I'm, I'm praying for you. Our team is praying for you. We know that every single person that's listening to this podcast is here by divine appointment. I mean, I talked to another person. I mean, you know, it's just amazing to me how these podcasts are going, how far and wide they're going. You know, share them with your friends. Help us get the word out because now is the time. I mean, now, I mean, it's past time, you guys. I mean, the world has, you know, in one sense gone crazy, but in another sense, there is a massive move of God for the sons of God to arise in the true uh, identity of who they are in Christ and for the gospel to be preached in a way that radically, radically, radically 
uh, reshapes the foundation of what it means to be a Christian, that it is Christ, it is Christ in us, and that you know we are coming after the spirit of religion and the illusion of separation, and that now is the time. Now is the time people are hurting, people are in, in desperate need of unconditional love and acceptance. They are in desperate need of purpose. They're in desperate need of, of, of an experience of God, an encounter with God, and a revelation of who they are. And so you're a part of it. If you're here, you're a part of it. You're divinely connected to it. Um, the, the truth is, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, millions of people that are that are, are are connected to me yet. But so if you're here, you're a part of this. You're a forerunner in this. And so hear God. Do what he tells you to do. Get the book. And, you know, sign up for a breakthrough call. Sign, do one of our mind renewal sessions. Do what you need to do so that you get in the place where you know the answer to these questions, that you have a compass in your hand and you are a part of the, the kingdom expansion project that is going on in the earth to a level that you never thought possible, supernaturally living in, in, in a way that demonstrates that Jesus Christ is alive, that he is in you, that if they've seen you, they've seen the Father because you are one with him. Let's renew our minds. Let's take this on. Let's say yes to God. Let's fully surrender. And guys, let's be a part of what God is doing in this hour. Anyway, God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And we will see you here soon. All right. God bless. Thanks for listening to Shalisa's podcast. This recording is, in part, made possible by our listeners. To partner with us, visit Shalise.com, where you can donate and help us spread the good news of our unshakable union with Christ around the globe. You can also find a link there to download Shalise's book, The Path, for free. And if you're ready to discover the call of God on your life and the purpose He created you for, then visit us at Shalise.com and watch Shalise's free training where you'll hear five keys to hearing God about your life purpose and transitioning into it. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, don't forget, the world needs the Christ in you.